Hi there. My name is Laura Milner. I'm the very proud dean of the College of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the Citizen State Bank uh, First Friday Lecture. We admitted we did not know what kind of crowd we would get today because we were a little nervous. We tell you to come to school, and then we cancel on you. Then we say we're going to do it again, then we cancel on you. So hopefully this is a good way to end your week as opposed to the way it started. Um, we have the pleasure today of listening to Brian Johnson, but my job is to introduce the man behind this series, Dennis Vogel, who's the CEO of Citizen State Bank. And this is like the, I think, the third year we've been doing this, isn't it? Yeah, so we're pleased. Anyway, for those of you who don't know, Citizen State Bank is a community bank in La Crosse, which has consistently been recognized as one of the top 100 community banks in the country in addition to being one of the happiest places to work in the world. Um, they do actually take pulses every week to see how their employees are doing, and it's, been, and it's informative and enlightening to um, Dennis as to if there are trouble spots, he can spot them and go talk to people to find out what's going on. Um, anyway, so prior to starting at Citizen State Bank in La Crosse in 2005, Dennis worked in another community bank where he worked himself up the corporate ladder in a very short period of time to become vice president of credit administration. He began his banking career as an intern while studying at UWL, where he obtained his BS in finance in 1997, followed by his MBA in 2002. In addition to his role at Citizen State Bank, Dennis is very active in other um, for-profit business ventures in the area, in addition to many nonprofit charitable organizations. So many, in fact, we're not going to list them for you. As a result of these efforts to constantly give back to the community, he has received several awards and honors over the years. He's, been recogni he's recognized the importance of getting involved at UWL, um, even as an undergraduate, and he was very active in both AMA um, and Finance Management Association at UWL. Um, more recently, he's been involved with the Silver Eagles Board of Directors. He takes great pride in our university and, whenever possible, tries to hire outstanding UWL graduates. We'll talk more about this at the end, but there is a reception, so we look forward to you coming and obviously talking up, Dennis, about what his career opportunities are. He's also started some scholarships for those uh, students who are pursuing a career, are thinking of pursuing a career in banking. So, with no further ado, Dennis Vogel. Thank you, Dean. Really appreciate uh, partnering up with us again, and uh, thank you for this being a great partnership for three years. Uh, I'll just be very brief before I turn over to Brian. We came here to listen to him, but I just want to offer a little advice. I try to do that every time, and I talk about, and the Dean talked about how I got started in banking was an internship. And I can't stress the importance of internships. You know, hopefully you're thinking about that. I know this is your first week back, but hopefully you're already thinking about summer and what you can do to separate yourself because a lot of you are going to have finance degrees, accounting degrees, economics, marketing. We get a lot of those resumes. How are you going to differentiate yourself? And when I talk to students, I often hear, well, there's no good, you know, internships out there. There's nothing good out there. Well, there was one I was trying to get. I didn't get it. Don't use that as an excuse. Go get it. If there's some place you want to work, you think they could provide a great experience, reach out to their president. Reach out to their HR department. Be persistent. Take the initiative. That will be a real signal to someone that, you know, this is someone I want in my organization. We've got many success stories in our organization that came as a result of that. We don't post for a lot of positions because people want to work for us. They reach out, and we see that they have that initiative and that drive and persistence. We meet with them. There's someone that we want to fit in the organization. We're going to make it happen. So don't take that as an excuse and go to career services or look online. There's no internships out there. Make it happen yourself. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian. And obviously, he's got a phenomenal resume being the vice president, CFO for Global Solutions. But the one thing I want to point out is one of the last things that he mentions in his bio is that he's a veteran from the Persian Gulf. And I don't think our veterans get enough credit for what they've done for this country. So with that, I just want to give him a warm welcome and thank him for what he did for this country. Thanks, thanks, thanks. thanks Laura, and thanks, Dennis, for that uh, warm welcome. I'm, I'm happy to be here. And uh, the first thing I'll tell you about myself is that I'm not the most creative, creative person in the world. So the title of uh, my conversation here today is a kind of a literal interpretation. Uh, I left UWL here in 1988, and I haven't been on campus since then until today. 
So, and then in between there, which I'm going to tell you a lot of stories, is what I've done in my career, and it's taken me to roughly 30 some odd countries uh, throughout that time period. So I've done a lot of things, but again, not very creative, uh, but nonetheless. So put some framework around that. Um, I'll just use my career as, a, as an example for you. It's nothing more than that. Tell you lots of opinions, and they are just opinions and, and experiences that I've had, and hopefully you can draw some, uh, some lessons from that. And I'll just kind of build on three major building blocks. I'll talk a little bit about United Health Group, maybe a lot about United Healthcare and healthcare in general, uh, because I've spent the better part of my career at that company. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about corporate finance, of course, right? So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what I think you can expect to do. You're getting great education here, but let me just tell you what we do in practice. Again, telling you stories. I'll try not to make it sound like you're in class. Um, and then the last one, I'll sprinkle in stories along the way, and hopefully I've got time to tell a few more stories at the end, or at the end as well about international business. Again, I've been in the international side for about 20 years of that career as well. So we'll start just by giving you the lay of the land, just for context and what I've done in my journey. So again, I told you I graduated in 86. I had a double major in finance and, and economics. And you lucky kids today, the job market is fantastic. Back then, it wasn't so good. I struggled getting a really good job in my field. Just, uh, and instead of just struggling through it, I packed it in right away, moved back home with mom and dad, and went back to school for accounting and did nothing but accounting courses for a full year. And that opened up all kinds of different doors for me. And you could see I went into public accounting. I worked for Whipley. Many of you might know that name, but I worked for, for that company for quite a while. And I was in public accounting for about six, six and a half years. And then I went into private industry. So the first job I took uh, was, was a company called Methodist Hospital in the Twin Cities. And they, soon after I was there, they merged with uh, Park Nicollet Medical Center. It's now called Health System Minnesota. So again, some of you from Minnesota kids, you might have heard those names. And I was there for just two to three years, somewhere in that area, and I took that experience to kind of bridge to go United Health Group. And I thought it was, it was a bigger company, more opportunities for me, and that kind of got me in the door. Uh, and I've been there for the better part of 23 years doing a number of different things. When I first went to United Health Group, I was still kind of in that accounting area. I mean, that's what I was good at. But along the way, I was taking night courses, and I, was, I got my MBA. And I, I did that at, at night. It took me six years, one class at a time, but I was diligent, and I, and I got there. As soon as I got that paper in hand, I got the MBA, then it was time to do a about face, get as far away from accounting as I can, go straight into corporate finance. So I took a job with this little startup division called United Healthcare International at the time. And this was a big company, and that was a little R&D division. We had less than $3 million in revenue at the time, just to kind of give you a perspective on how it was. And it's been a wild ride since then. That division, uh, what, it, what started out uh, less than $3 million is now, give or take, about $13 billion in, in, import, in, in terms of relative size inside of UHG. Now, full transparency, I'm not the CFO for all $13 billion. We've got companies all over all over uh, South America and, and the United States, and I'm a portion of, portion of those companies I'm the CFO for. I'm going to tell you a little bit about those as well. Interesting story, and you can read the stuff on the bottom. I'm not going to read all slides. I'm going to try and just tell stories, and you can uh, scan uh, what might be interesting. But one piece of advice I have for you, one thing I say on the bottom there, look for defining moments and experiences in your life, just like in your private life, in your personal life. You get married, you have kids. There's defining moments in your life. And your career is going to have the same thing. So look for those opportunities. And I'll tell you the opportunity that struck me, uh, that impacted me, and I didn't know it at the time, but looking back, it was very prevalent. And about that time that I went into this international division that I told you about, uh, the company hired a guy by the name of Simon Stevens. You can Google him later. And uh, he was a very senior individual. He lived, he lived in London. He was a Brit by trade. Uh, uh, and no sooner, and he was, had a lot of responsibilities at UHG, only one of them being this little division that I was in. Uh, not more than six months later, he fired the entire leadership team of this division. And I, and I wasn't at the leadership team. I was the next level down. And here I am. I've been at UHG for a while now. I kind of know the corporate. I know what the corporation expects. I know the administrative nature and wh what we do. So he's over there in London doing his things, and he tosses me the keys to the car. Here you go, Brian. Take care of things. Okay, let's do this. And that's just changed everything for me looking back. Now, to put this in complete perspective, and then I'll move on, Simon left the company about four or five years ago. And 
he still has the same job that he left for. He runs the national health system in the UK and his boss is the prime minister. So that gives you a perspective, um, someone how senior he was, and he doesn't want to be dealing with the day-to-day -day kind of stuff. That's what I was doing. So that was a defining moment for me. Everything since that time started then. Um, the other thing, before we move on, uh, you might have noticed in my, my statement there in the bottom, words of wisdom, it, in the end, the only thing that matters is results. You know, in the short term, in the long run, that's true, right? And, uh, uh, a very senior individual told me that early in my career, and I always remember that, and I still repeat that to the people that work for me today. You know, you might, you might have great short-term successes, uh, but in the end, the only thing that matters is results. And I tell these stories to when I'm, I'm mentoring my employees all the time, and I tell a long speech, and now all I have to do to remind them what that speech is, and I say, don't have a lunch pail attitude. Be careful of a lunch pail attitude. And what I mean by that, and I'll shorten up the speech for the benefit of this crowd, but I tell them, don't go home at night after a hard day's work feeling really good about yourself. That's good in short terms, but in the end, did, the, did, did you impact the business? Did positive things happen? Did you help influence decisions that, that if were directly felt by the business. In the end, the only thing that matters is results. Ah, okay, so let's jump into United Health Group and uh, healthcare a little bit. One of the things that I want you to, we'll talk a little bit about this company, and, and one of the reasons that I, I want to dive into it a little bit is because you've got to pick industries that you're going into. And my bias, and I'm going to try and convince you a little bit, and maybe I tease you with a few of my stories, healthcare is a tremendous industry to be in. You can't go wrong. So the mission of the company is we help people live healthier lives and help the health system work better for everyone. Okay, so our mission isn't to sell insurance and make money. Our insurance is, that's just a conduit, but our mission is to help people. And the health system is recognizing that everybody is a part of the system. Provide, doctors, providers, insurance companies, uh, you that are purchasing insurance, etc. So it's a broad mission, but that's what the company is. Everybody here watches TVs. I'm sh TV. I'm sure you've seen the commercials. The two major brands of United Health Group are United Healthcare and Optum. Those are brands. Below that are all kinds of businesses. There are hundreds of businesses that make up United Health Group. And uh, one thing that's common for all businesses, and I'm sure Dennis will tell you the same thing about his business, it doesn't matter what kind of a business you're in, some basic principles of being successful are you've got to provide a quality product, right? at a reasonable price. You've got to be able to compete. And you're going to compete on price, you're going to compete on quality, and you're striving for both. When United Health Group looks through that lens, the main competencies that we uh, uh, talk about are clinical insight, technology, data, and information. Sounds boring, right? But let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Clinical insight. Uh, and here's why I'm trying to convince you that healthcare is something to consider. In the United States, give or take, we spend $3.5 trillion a year. That's the size of health care spend in the United States. The rest of the world combined is about that same amount. So the industry is $7 trillion worldwide. I've got to believe that's, one, that's the biggest industry there is. I don't know, but I'm just pontificating here. Um, that's one reason. Now, going back to the United States, $3.5 trillion we spend a year combined in the United States. I see statistics all the time that anywhere between 60 and 75 percent of those dollars are spent on people with chronic conditions. Okay? Chronic, the literal word chronic, right? Diabetes, hypertension, um, obesity, mental health, an issue that you're dealing with over a long period of time, perhaps your entire life. Those are the people that are taxing the system because they constantly need care. 60 to 75 percent is spent on those. So this is why. Uh, clinical insight is a big part of our company to have insight into these diseases. We're not just an insurance company, but how do we make people healthier if we don't understand the, the disease itself? Interesting fact, United Health Group is the second largest employer of doctors and nurses in the country after only the U.S. government. Uh, technology, technology, you know, changes every industry and we're no different. You know, it won't be long, you know, you're going to whip out your smartphone. I need to make a doctor's appointment. You're going to find your doctor. You're going to make an appointment. And, you know, I won't go too much into it. We could spend all day. But needless to say, technology is a huge part of healthcare. The last one I want to touch on, data and information. Um, 300 million people in the United States, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guesstimate that we have probably about 100 million as members of United Health Group. 100 million people consuming health care every, every year. Every time you go to the doctor, the doctor is performing uh, 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 procedures that have codes, diagnosis that have codes. So think about the huge volumes of data that you have there. And you all remember your statistics, statistics classes. 100 million people con consuming, and you have years and years of data. That's statistically accurate, right? So imagine for a moment. Now, again, how we use this data is, is really, uh, there's all sorts of ways we use it. But let me tell you an interesting story. In your lifetime, it won't be too long. Right now, you buy a car. You buy, uh, you buy anything electronic. You go online. You do a little research. And you compare in your mind what you get on a co kind of a cost benefit. If I spend a little more, I get these additional features. If I spend a little more, it's a better brand, more reliable. And you make that judgment, right? But if you get uh, uh, sick and you need heart surgery, you don't, have that, you don't do that same thing. You go talk to your doctor and he says, yeah, I know a guy. Here's a referral. Go talk to him. And that doctor, then you go to him and it seems like professional, seems like he's know what he's doing. Okay, cut me open. Let's do this, right? But imagine, in your lifetime, when that happens, you can go online to, 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 and look at the data that we have, and this is, information is available today. You look on there, Dr. A did this procedure five times last year, and three times he was successful. Dr. B did it 100 times last year, and he, 99 times he was successful. I like this guy, but let's keep looking. Dr. C did it 100 times this year, he was also successful 99 times, but he was half the price. There's the winner. That information is available. Data is fantastic. There's all sorts of reasons why it's not readily consumed today. Regulation, and I don't really want to go into it, but at the end of the day, in your lifetime, there's a lot of pressure to make that available for us. So again, now, walking in here, how many of you are really interested to say, I want to go work for an insurance company? But am I starting to change your mind just a little bit? So just some fast facts here in United Health Group. 226 billion in revenue, 140 million members, so individuals that consume our products worldwide. 300,000 people. That revenue number puts us number five on the Fortune 500 company, and it's a member of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So some pretty impressive statistics, and the headquarters is two and a half hours away from here. But you don't, I'm not saying if you're interested here, you have to go to, go there. I'm saying be entertained and, and pursue perhaps uh, health care. Um, in fact, there's a business in La Crosse. The United Health Group have businesses in Eau Claire, Wausau, Wauwatosa, Green Bay, you name it. It's a big company, right? I'm going to go through a couple more slides a little bit quicker. But again, back to the two brands, United Healthcare and Optum. United Healthcare, for, for sake of simplicity, is the insurance arm. And Optum is the other side is healthcare services. They do all sorts of other, uh, all sorts of different things. You'll see that bottom uh, bullet point there underneath that healthcare is the global. That's the division that I work for, the one I've been talking to you a little bit about. Now let me go into just one slide here a little bit and some, tell you some interesting stories about global solutions. This is the business that I'm in. Generally speaking, the target market for our business is people that cross international borders and they also need unique health and well-being services, but it's different because you're crossing an international border, right? Uh, if you're an expatriate, you're a mid-level manager, and they send you to Taiwan to run the plant for two years, a two-year assignment, and then come back. And you take your family with you. So we have products for that, for that kind of thing. Uh, Global Medical is an in interesting one. Uh, if you're a mining company in, uh, in the oil fields of Iraq, or if you're an uh, oil exploration in the northern uh, tundra of Canada, you have workers out there, but, but there's no facilities, are there? Under contract, they have to provide health care to their employees. What do they do? They contract with us. We drop a clinic on site, hire employees, so some more interesting stuff that we do. The one that I find the most interesting here, though, that I spent a lot of time on is the assistance business. Most people from the United States don't know what that is. Most people out of the United States that were raised outside the United States do because it's standard. If you don't have health care or if you're homeless or it doesn't matter, but if you get into an emergency situation in the United States and you happen to find yourself to an emergency room, you will get taken care of. That's just the way our system works. That's not true outside the United States. So I had a client talk to me uh, in a meeting with a client and he was 
Give me a real life example. He had an employee in the Middle East. He got shot, and it wasn't a mortal wound. He was able to get himself to a hospital, but nope, couldn't have, show proof of payment, didn't have credit cards. We're not going to let you in. Okay, went to the next place, and at the end of the day, the guy died because he bled out. That's the way it works. And it's not just the haves and the have-nots, the rich and the poor. It doesn't matter. Case in point, a couple of years ago, a true story, uh, an executive for UHG went on a safari in South Africa. While on the safari, they got gored by a water buffalo. Again, true story. They were able to get themselves to a hospital. They were receiving care. But when their credit cards were maxed out, they were still weren't stable. They needed more care. The hospital was refusing to provide additional care. Well, they knew that global, this little global division existed, so a phone call, a phone call, and a phone call tracked us down. We intervened, took care of the person, etc. But the point being is healthcare is very different around the world. It's not as boring as insurance sounds. Let's talk a little bit about finance, right? And uh, you all know what this is, and, and I'm going to try and make this so it doesn't feel like class, and I'm going to say some things that hopefully your instructors are not telling you. So uh, this is, okay, what is corporate finance? And you guys know this better than I do because you're fresh out of class, right? Probably have a test on it next week. The part that I want to uh, uh, focus in on is on the bottom there. In short, any operation or aspect that involves the finances of the organization. That's very broad. But in my world, that's, that's what it is. Now, Dennis was telling you about the financial service, the banking and the financial services. So let me tell you a little bit before I dive in. Let me tell you what I'm not going to talk about. I'm not talking about that. So there's all sorts of careers out there that Dennis described as well as, you know, you want to be an investment banker and go to Wall Street. I mean, the management of money and investments is the service, the industry in and of itself, right? Servicing members, companies, companies and individuals. That's not what I'm talking about. So more broadly, corporate finance is you can work for an insurance company, you can work for a manufacturer, a restaurant, a popcorn manufacturer. It doesn't matter. But the point is, is you're in that industry, you're simply a member of the team supporting that business model. That, that's what corporate finance is in, in using, again, my career as an example. So and you can see, and this my little tongue-in-cheek here, but it's the truth, right? To this day, I work with very senior individuals, very accomplished people, salespeople, and I swear to God, their spouse probably balances their checkbook. They have a different skill set, so it's the sum of the parts. You're offering financial, and other people are going to bring sales, marketing, legal, and you all kind of uh, make the leadership team and how you make that engine run, okay? I'm going to come back to this, but I just want to... I'm not going to answer the question now, but I want you to think about that. Is finance an art or a science? Okay? And my friend Albert Einstein here kind of uh, answers that question here a little bit. But think about that, and, uh, and we'll come back to that. Another thing now, it won't be long. You'll be graduating. You'll be looking for a job. This is a consideration, small versus big. It is very different. The smaller, the bigger the company, the more sophisticated the accounting or the financial, corporate finance needs are. Just by its very nature, you're dealing with larger pools of cash, more complex businesses. Uh, it doesn't make it better. I'm saying it's different. My brother-in-law is about my age, and he also graduated with a finance degree in, a, in the UW system. And again, the job market wasn't so great back then. Again, being my age, he took a first job, his first job as an entry-level accounting job. Uh, with a finance degree, with a small manufacturer in the Twin Cities. He's still working there. It's the only company he's ever worked for. He's the chief operating officer, reports to the owner. He runs that company. So again, that's what I mean by it's not, but it's different. So go into it with, with uh, eyes wide open. And this is just relative here just to prove that point, uh, what, the, what it looks like. The vast majority of companies out there are smaller. This is dated material here, but 2012, but you can see. Uh, our, our, our economy is dominated by smaller companies. And I'm just trying to keep it light here, so if I find some things to entertain you with a little bit, but uh, I, I can visualize this, especially in smaller companies, right? Uh, they know everything about that. They don't really need a corporate finance because, in fact, I bet there's a number of you in here that have mothers and fathers who own businesses. 
and I bet they know everything about that business. They know how much they charge for their services, how much the competitors charge, they know how much their costs are, they know everything. So there, that's why I kind of mean there isn't necessarily a need for as much corporate finance in small companies. So let's do a little bit here about what might I be doing. One of the, one of the things I think uh, be doing is, you know, your first day on the job, financial reporting. I'm not talking a balance sheet and an income statement. I'm talking, it could be anything, and I'll give you a couple of examples here. You're just analyzing the, the product, you're looking at the sales trends, uh, quarter over quarter. That chart on the bottom is actually one that I use in one of my businesses where it's tracking claims volumes. And here's an interesting uh, thing, the way that I run my department. Uh, and, and how I use some of my fina uh, financial analyst resources, especially you kids nowadays, because the difference between you guys and, and dinosaurs like me is your technology skills are off the charts. So I use those technology skills uh, a lot. We generate a lot of reports that, and here's the, here's the secret sauce, we generate a lot of reports that are designed to ask the questions, not answer them. Okay, so it helps you monitor the business, and we're monitoring trends. And, and if I can get a, uh, if if I can get uh, young kids like you, and I have a number of them that work for me, to, so every month they push the button, it rolls out the machine automatically. I want to see it. So I have stacks of paper like this. I'm flipping through, and I might spend 30 seconds with it because there's not. But if I see one, it pops. Again, it's financial analysis to monitor the business to track data. And it could be anything, uh, volume data, efficiency data. It could be on cost, could be on revenue, you know, go crazy. It could be anything. But being able to program that in the system and automate it is powerful. That's the kind of stuff, day one, you know, you may not do that long, but that's some of the stuff. Here's some other things you'll get, you know, the first few years you'll get involved in is business plan. This is very important. Sometime in the early part of your career, you have to get some exposure to this. I'm not saying you have to have a position that says you're in charge of financial planning, but you have to be exposed to it. If you get 10 years into your career and you've never experienced it, it's going to be a hole in your experience, okay? It's going to be hard to, it might, again, this is the opinion part, but it's going to be hard, I think, for you to take a leap to a very senior director level position running a company if you have no experience on how the financial budgeting and planning process works with. So let me describe that just a little bit. Um, the, the numbers part is just the measuring the activity, but this, the business planning process is when you get to work with the leaders of, of the organization on, well, what do you want to do next year? You know, what are your key initiatives? And then we'll help you measure them. We'll help you measure whether it's a good idea or not from a, uh, from a, uh, um, a return perspective. And let me get more precise there for a moment. Again, it's not just the calculations. A lot of what you do is fourth grade math, isn't it? It's, so it's understanding it and applying it. In business planning, sometimes when this happens and you get very junior people and they'll just take, it's like you're a, a, you know, a waitress or, or a waiter, a server that's just taking an order. Uh, oh, you said that? Okay, I'll write that down. Here's the budget. Now you gotta be, a, you gotta scrutinize things. And let's say this leader, this sales leader says, you know what, we're a regional firm. I want to open up an office in the southeast part of the United States that will really increase our revenue crazy. Put that in the budget. No problem. Let's do that. Okay. So with the finance guys is you need to, well, how much, right? Make, put a number on it, and we'll actually go to the point where if it's a sales leader wanting to drive this, we'll put that into his incentive plan, the way he gets paid. So don't convince the company to spend a half a million, two million, five million dollars and open up a new office, and you say that we're going to generate 20 million dollars of new revenue per year, if it only turns out to be 500,000. Put your money where your mouth is. So the point is you have to really push and scrutinize that uh, a little bit. And you'll do the rest of the calculations. Let's say he's, he knows what he's talking about, he backs it up, he gave you market data that says yes it's going to work, he's convinced people, he's had his day in court. If we do this, yes, that's 20 million dollars. Okay, you guys fill out the rest of it. You will work with all the other people uh, on what the cost parts, what the cost part to set that up. You'll do the, the fancy calculations, the internal rate of return, the NPV, all that kind of stuff. 
But the real fun part about this was understanding the business and working with the leaders on what are we going to do next year, okay? So financial planning is key. And here's another tip that I'm going to say, uh, tell you. If we, sifting through the ideas at the idea table there, okay? So here's what I see all the time, and maybe it's just the businesses that I've been part of, but what I find one of the hardest things for businesses to do is to say no and decide what not to do, okay? Especially when you get into a company that have a lot of smart people, everybody's got ideas, and there's an innovative culture. You have too many ideas to execute on. And you have to have the discipline in the organization to limit what you're going to work on and where you're going to put your resources into. Otherwise, you, you minimize everything. You're working on everything, and you don't actually get anywhere. Happens all the time. So you, as the finance person, adds value to that organization by being the governor, and one of the main governors is the annual business plan. I won't read you all these, but you can scan them. I'm sure your instructors are telling you this stuff, too. But I guess if your instructors are telling you this, and now I'm telling you this, the same thing, unsolicited, unsolicited, I think it's true. So the one that I'll talk about a little bit is something I'm sure you're all thought of, but it's that third one, balancing changing jobs too much with becoming complacent. In the early years, you have to learn. You have to be a sponge. You've got to move around. You, you have to. If you find yourself coming to work in the morning, and it's the same thing you've been doing for six months, and it doesn't... You know, you're doing yourself a disjust disjustice in the first few years. Injustice is the word. Jeez, I didn't take English. I don't have an English major. Um, be careful. If a resume crosses my desk and I'm, and I'm hiring a financial analyst and you've been at three different employers in the first five years, you probably go to the bottom of the list for me. But, so that's why I say you've got to strike a balance. So what might be really good is to move within the company. I'm just saying, be careful uh, on what it, uh, when you're starting out. I'm a big Warren Buffett fan. Where's my finance guys? With the, TJ, yeah. Uh, I love this guy. So uh, when I needed a quote here to entertain you with, he's the guy I went to. So he's saying the same thing, especially early in your careers. Okay, um, it's it's just a fact. Okay, a little bit more here on, uh, and I won't, I'll go through a little bit quicker because we might be getting ahead of ourselves, uh, but I want you to at least start to think about some things you're going to be doing uh, later on in your career. Okay, we're running good here. Just a little bit more sophisticated. You've seen these things in class, right? Uh, you're learning the calculations. You don't have to memorize this stuff. Keep the books or remember that exists. You'll go back to it. I still do that. I don't remember all the calculations, but I can diagnose what I need to apply, and I go back and I pull that out, and I figure it out, right? Uh, so instead of just doing some financial report, you're going to be kind of the brains behind some things now, and you're going to be driving some things. Let me, let me point one out here, break-even points. You all know the calculation. Again, it's, it's fourth-grade math, right? It's fixed cost divided by the gross margin, and you can take that break-even, and you can push it out into the future, how, how large do you have to get in order to hit your target margin. You play with that basic calculation, you can do a lot of things. So I was working with a company in, uh, um, in India, a small company that I work with, their small healthcare company, and they have a number of different products. And when we were going through the annual business plan, they had this one product that was losing money. And we determined that, well, I was helping them, but the local people were determining and making the assessment that, you know what, the market is saturated. We're going to really struggle to grow a lot. We're losing money today. Not sure we can reduce our cost that much more. We need to just shut this business down. We don't believe it's viable to become a profitable business. Based on the income statements that were rolling out of the system, that's exactly the decision they made. But then I got involved. I said, okay, time out. Let's look at this a little bit. When you look at it, and they had multiple product lines, and you have fixed costs, right? And you have fixed costs, you spread them all along the different product lines. Now, you take this one product, yes, it looks ugly, you're losing money. But if you get out of that business, so that revenue comes out, but the fixed cost stays, what happens? You're increasing losses on the other products that you have. It's a bad deal. So as long as you have a product line, it was a small company, but as long as you had this product, that was producing positive gross margin, it was covering all its variable cost, 
plus enough to help offset and help pay for some of your fixed cost, you were better off keeping this product than you were getting rid of it. Okay? So that's application of the things that you're learning in, in class. I heard this a little bit today uh, in, in one of the presentations I would add earlier, group, and earlier but and it's perhaps a little bit hard uh, to focus on this too much at, at this point in your career, but let me just tell you this. At some point, the soft skills get, become more important than the technical skills. Uh, I have an individual that works for me. I swear to God, he's twice as smart as I am. You know, his technology skills off the chart, he is really, really good, okay? He's one of those types of individuals that if I have a problem or a business problem or an ask, I don't even have to know anything about it. I just say, hey, Jason, go take care of this for me. And I know it will be done. It will be done right. His acumen is tremendous. But I don't think he's ever going to get another promotion in his life because his soft skills aren't there. So I'm not saying you need to do anything now, but remember this. Ten years from now, when you want to go to those more senior levels, Along the way, you're going to have to start gaining some of these skills, otherwise it, eventually it will catch up to you. S some tips uh, in this area. Um, I'm sure you've seen most of them. Maybe the top one that people haven't told you, but this is, again, my own personal philosophies in life. Uh, there are smart people everywhere, you, you, you know, and I think if you believe that you're gonna, your career is going to be carried on that big brain and IQ that you have, I'm not sure that's true, right? I don't believe it. I think there are smart people everywhere. So, it's a, so be humble about that and recognize that. And it's the other things that I'm talking about. It's experience, it's soft skills, it's everything else that's included. It's not just intelligence that's going to get you there, okay? And I only got one slide on this because now I know we're really getting ahead of each other, but maybe I can help think about when you're starting the, in the interview process, right? Actually, when people call me the, in, in business, when people call me the CFO, I almost kind of feel that it doesn't do its justice. Uh, because at this point in my career, I'm a businessman, right? If you think about CEOs and presidents of companies, I mean, what are, what, what's their technical skill, right? You don't even know. They might have come up through the finance ranks, legal, mark, you don't know. But at some point, they graduated from out of their lane, and they became a business person, okay? So when you're in an interview and you get that quintessential question, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Think about that. Maybe you can craft a story that sounds impressive, right? Well, I mean, I'm going to pursue a finance career. I'm going to learn as much, but I think eventually I want to become a businessman where I can lead, drive a business, be the CEO of, a biz uh, of the business. I don't know. But uh, these are some of the types of things that, uh, that you'll be thinking about. I know, I mean, no one would ever hire me as a salesman. We would go bankrupt. But I have supervised sales organization before, and I can do it well. Because I'm a businessman, I know how they need to function, and I have leaders there that I, they know what they're doing. Uh, okay, so it, you're kind of moving out of your lane and moving up to be a business person. Another uh, interesting quote here for you. Employers and business leaders are people that can think for themselves, who need people who can think for themselves, who take initiative uh, and be part of this. You hear that all the time. I've heard that a number of times today. Dennis was talking about that. This is, again, another validation. It's very true. To be very successful... I have people like that, too. I have financial analysts to me. I have smart people that don't do a, anything more than exactly what I tell them to do. And then I have other people who may, may have less experience, but they have initiative. They'll go out and they'll do all sorts of new things and be creative. So um, that's a well-cherished uh, skill. Now let's answer that question. These are things that I talk to when, I, when I'm mentoring and teaching my my people all the time. The first 10 years of your career, seven, eight, whatever, clearly you're focusing on the technical aspect of your job. What does it take to, to function properly and to perform the job as a financial analyst or any kind of uh, finance business career, right? You're focusing on it. But at some point, it all evens out. I, I would say that I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, the education you're getting here at UWL is the same information they're teaching at Stanford and Harvard, right? 
the institution is, nobody's inventing finance at this point. They're just teaching you these skills. So after 10 years, you know it as well as anybody else. It's the other soft skills. It's becoming a, a, an artist, if you will, in your field of study is what's going gonna, gonna to drive you forward from there. Okay, got enough time to cover a little bit of uh, on the international business flavor. So first thing, let's just stick to the technical part. Everything that I've said so far is true, but now there's a whole other uh, section of things that you have to understand. Um, we, when you're in international business, we have companies all, all over the world, and there's no way you're going to know what all the tax laws are. Know how to, you're going to you're gonna get real used to using experts and hiring outside consultants. Hey, we're moving into to this country. Can you give me a, what's the tax laws or what are the compliance rules for opening up a company and getting a license, this kind of stuff, right? So you're going to have that kind of a, a thing going on. I'll just give you one example that, 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 you'll, that you'll understand. So we have an insurance company in Ireland, and we have uh, many companies in the United States. We hire people in Ireland to support the company that we have in the United States. So now think about the income statements. The revenue is here in the United States. It's billed and recognized in the United States. But yet we have some people in Ireland, different legal entity, so they have some of the expenditures. So the payroll and all that cost is there. Now think about what the P&Ls look like all the way on the bottom. The earnings on the U.S. side is a little overinflated because it's missing those costs. IRS likes that. You're paying more tax, right? The equivalent of the IRS and double, they don't like that. You're expensing these workforce costs, but we're not getting into the revenue. Your earnings are deflated. You're not paying me my fair share. Transfer pricing is, is, a, is uh, the technical area that we get into when you're dealing with that kind of a situation. And again, you're working with outside counsel, but it's what I just explained. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's just technical, and you've got to pay attention to those kinds of things, and, and you have to imp, uh, put that into your daily routine. Now let's talk about some more of the fun stuff, though, right? The more of the cultural aspect of it. I think when we're talking about international business, that's kind of some of the first things that come to your mind. Uh, and let me tell you a couple of stories there to kind of hit that home. So I, I work with a company, a chain of hospitals in Portugal. And uh, we bought this chain a few years ago. And uh, one of my supervisors, a couple levels up, and I'm going to ca call him Tom. Heck of a nice guy. Very charismatic, always smiling, life of the party. He's a guy you want to party with. Really nice guy, OK? And he's, he's more senior than I am. So going through the acquisition process and the first kind of uh, shaking of the hands and all that kind of stuff, and, in the first few months of working with them, clearly he was having much more uh, a relationship with them than I was, right? And then they kind of say, here you go, Brian. You're a dinosaur. You've been around forever. Go help these guys. Help them understand how, what, what a company needs to do when you're owned by the United Family and just teach them, right? So I went in, and uh, six months later, after working with these guys, the CEO, his name is Jose Carlos, Real interesting character. He's probably in his 60s, very, very reserved. Sits in the boardroom and kind of, you know, does very soft spoken, but he controls the room by little, you know. He's a fascinating guy. He loves heavy metal music. And anyway, he pulled me to the side and he said, You know, Brian, we really like your approach to this. You've been our guardian angel. And he called me that. And the point that he was telling me you want, is, is that my approach, I'll go back to Tom. Tom, again, well-liked guy, but he's the quintessential U.S. type A business guy, right? And, uh, and, and it's going to come across as a little bit where you have to build the relationships first. doesn't matter how nice Tom is. The fact of the matter is the approach is going to put uh, people off just on the cultural differences. Let's be honest. Do, can we go to Portugal and I'll magically tell them how to run their business and their culture? I mean, they know what they're doing. So um, it's interesting fact. Let me give you another quick story and then I'll, and I'll see how much time I got for stories here. <laughs> um, I, I've been to the Philippines quite a few times. Um, in fact, remember I was talking about the assistance business? I've been to the Philippines when they had an earthquake. Uh, I've been to the Philippines when they were going through a political coup when um, 
Imelda Marcos was overthrown. And uh, what else happened? Oh, I was in there when, I had, when we had a car crash. Now, all of those ended up being minor, but those events, that assistance business I was telling you about, if I needed help, I could call that line and, and we got guys that'll come and get you out. <laughs> okay, so it's part of the health and well-being. So anyway, I detracted, but I wanted to throw that in there. But anyway, what I was told about the Philippines when we first started working with these companies there is, again, great people, you're working with them, you think that you're getting along, you're asking questions or you're giving them uh, some instruction for what you're going to do next month and they're all, yes, sure, no problem, we'll take care of it, mm -hmm. yes. Months later we learned, they kept, they kept saying yes, but nothing's getting done. Why is that? So again, and this is, I don't know if this is fact, it was just a story that told to me, but they told me if you look at the uh, historical uh, this country in its historical perspective the last several hundred years, they're a culture that has always been occupied by an occupying force, okay? And when you have that over hundreds of years, they have developed, uh, uh, they're all, they, always, they say yes to everything, right? And when we were in business, they're saying yes to everything, but they actually didn't mean yes. Uh, so another interesting thing about uh, international business. So. Building relationships is by far the most important. And, and the last thing I'll say uh, here is that one on the bottom, I really think that international business exposure will change you as an individual. I know it's changed me. Uh, in this day and age, you can pick neighbors, right? From a homogeneous population. They're the same race, they're the same religion, they're both from the Midwest. One is an extreme Republican conservative. The other one is an extreme liberal Democrat, and they hate each other. But 99% of everything else about them, they're the same, but they hate each other. Okay? And then we don't talk about, we're, we're not supposed to talk about, you know, and respect all our religion. You almost have to be like, uh, I'm struggling with the words here, but you don't overemphasize any of your beliefs, whether it's religion or political persuasions. You kind of be... Uh, courteous to everybody, right? You go to a lot of these other countries, and I'm telling you, right out of the gate, they want to talk religion, they want to talk uh, politics, they want to show you their culture, and they're proud of it, and it's, it's just very different. And, uh, and when you can, and over time, you'll know, realize people that are so different from you in every face uh, that you can think of, and you're getting along, and then you, and then you kind of wonder, well, why, why are people like that in the United States? But anyway, I guess my point on telling that story is that I'm much more forgiving, and I, I'm much more, uh, don't have nearly as strong opinions when I'm dealing with uh, people in the United States anymore, because I, I just have learned that. And uh, it seems like our culture here in the United States is just, you know, stand by your position. Uh, and it, I don't know. I'm rambling here a little bit, but I think that is very important and it's something I would not have learned if not for the exposure to all these different cultures. Last slide here, last picture, and I think I've said it, but I'll just say it again. It's relationships, you know, and I, I told you a couple of stories and, and I could tell you a, a number of other ones, but, you know, it's, it's funny, in the United States, I'm going to venture to guess here, right, you can conduct business with other, with other businesses um, and develop partnerships and not have a really, not even like each other, right? If the economics and the commercials work out, well, you'll work with anybody. Most of the companies I worked with overseas, that's not true, right? And they j you just won't uh, work until you build that relationship. So it takes longer. You have to invest the time. All of these things are so important. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions. We can talk about anything. Pardon? Um, yo, yes. What was the most challenging uh, cultural experience I've had? And the thing that first pops into my mind is uh, it's working with the China. Uh, in China is just first it's it's a, it's extremes, language, cultural, it's extremes. It's also highly controlled by the government. We just come from two different planets. And another thing that uh, I realized we were uh, years ago we were we were going through a due diligence and looking to partner with one of the largest insurance companies in China and buy into them. 
And you all know enough, and you know what the due diligence, and you value the company, you finance guys, right, and some of that kind of stuff. But if you go back about 10 years, this is about 10 years ago, and you think about companies were pouring money into China. That was the next great superpower. You've got to be there or you're going to miss out. That was the whole macroeconomic environment here on, in the world. Well, they had that attitude. We wanted to perform diligence. We wanted to see papers. We wanted to, to value their company. And they, well, what do you mean? You know, they just expected us to come there and write down a big check for millions of dollars, and boom, we're in business together. So, uh, so for those two reasons, and, and it's still a little difficult in, in China today, just from the, you know, our governments, let's be honest, uh, are, are make it difficult for us. I'm glad you asked that question because I actually have employees that uh, that uh, uh, um, that report directly for me that live in China. So I have a team of five people in China, and this is one of those groups that's not corporate finance. I mean, I've got account managers and provider relationship managers that report to me. So, good question. Okay, good question. So in the healthcare, how has the shift uh, in the, the U.S. government impacts shifted our business? Well, tremendously, of course. Um, and it's difficult because it's a moving, it's a moving target. Um, I'll tell you. I mean, we, we've been in and out of some of those businesses because they're just not profitable. It's a noble effort. Our comp the CEO of our company has come out and said that uh, having everybody covered we're the richest country on earth. It's kind of a shame that everybody doesn't have access to health care. So we have to figure this out and how you, how you have, uh, um, um, how you gain health care access to everybody. So our, our CEO has come out and said he doesn't want uh, PIPACA, Obamacare, if you will, to be un, uh, completely unva unveiled because it just doesn't seem right. On the other hand, though, but I will tell you that they went about it the wrong way. It was all politics. They didn't solve any of the economics. Okay, it's costing more money. And let me give you a little bit of window into, it's, it's health insurance is not really a full uh, free market. W when you have legally compliant health insurance, the government mandates how much we charge for our price. They mandate how much we have to cover. You guys are youngsters, but you know what it is. And I remember years ago when Viagra came out, the government says you have to cover that. So I'll give you an example. So they will f force us on what our benefits are. They force us what the profits are. They force us to 80% of all premiums we collect have to be spent on the members. If you go through a year and you don't spend 80, you have to give money back, and they mandate your bottom line. So it's really difficult to, to solve the world's problems when it's so highly regulated. So, so to answer your question simply, I mean, we've got to play ball. Well, they, they have us by the nose because it's so highly regulated. Um, ROTC was a big, a big thing for me, and, and I would say less of a mentor, it was more of an experience. You have classes in leadership, so they taught me how to be a leader. And then that was kind of like inside me someplace. And then when Simon Stevens was a huge uh, influence on me, the guy that I told you about, part of it is that here's a guy who's on a completely different plane than I am intellectually and where he is in his career. I mean, think about who this guy was, right? But yet he gave me the respect that he knew what I did. In fact, here's the, I mean, I haven't done a resume since 1999. I took that job as, as the, that first finance job, and he dragged me along the way. So he just kept, as long as I was delivering, he kept feeding me more responsibility. So he was huge. And I will tell you, it was one of the tips there if you read it, but I've learned just as much from people who were terrible bosses from the ones that were good. Yes. As you said, there are a lot of smart people. Some of them are up here, the same people with the same intelligence are down here. Are there any recommendations on how a person should treat the politics of a large corporation in order to uh, achieve what they want? Yeah, very, very astute question because politics is a way of life, and I deal with it day in, day out. Um, 
And along the way, what I always did, and I had this on one of my slides too, and one of those things that helped me is that I always just did the right thing. If I made a mistake, but I knew I could defend it, I don't care. Fire me. Play politics with me. I'm doing the right thing, and I'm doing the right thing for the company and for, the, uh, uh, for what our purpose is. And then uh, that was my way of staying out of the politics because I would lose that game, right? But I just always did the right thing and tried to be good at what I've done. And I tell you, another career aspiration of mine was to never be laid off. <laughs> so far, I haven't. And, that's, and I say that jokingly because it's not common this day and age. I mean, just because of cost cutting has nothing to do with your performance uh, and your value. People cut costs all the time, and it hasn't happened to me yet. And I think part of what I did, I stayed out of the politics. And, and maybe also to the extent what I was saying here, too, about what I've learned on working with so many different cultures is that I'm a little bit more even keel in my opinions, and I don't take such strong one way or the other. So... Let's take one more question. What motivated me to? Um, my blue collar roots. I just wanted to. Um, I just I wanted to be successful, and I didn't want to fail at anything I did. You know, I'm from a small town, 700 people. I'm the first one in my, in my family to ever go to college. So I didn't have these great aspirations of being president and multi-millions and rich. That was never it. Mine was just to be successful and, and, and internal motivations that weren't necessarily business-driven. That was mine, I guess. So we have just the smallest token for you, you. of appreciation. Let's give Brian a big hand. Thank you, everybody. Okay, because I always like to know the audience. Who here are accounting majors? Who here is economics majors? Who here is finance majors? Who here is information systems majors? They're the brave hand. There we go. Who here is international business majors? All right. Um, marketing. Management. Anybody outside the College of Business? Ham Miners, Health Analytics Management Miner. All right, got a couple there. We thank you for coming. Um, per usual, we have to thank Dennis. And right after this, I, I encourage you and challenge you to please come to the reception where we can all practice our soft skills. And the first drink, alcoholic or non, will be on Dennis. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, we have to thank our uh, College of Business Administration. All of a sudden, everybody in the first row got very excited. Anyway, the College of Business Administration Board of Advisors, the faculty, um, and the staff for today. We have to thank Jeff Myers, who's the development officer, who has managed to make the contact today to bring us Brian, so we very much appreciate that. We also are thanking the Financial Management Association for being our student host today. They're the ones that were handing you out the, um, the uh, brochures, and they'll be the ones that are also handing you the drink tickets at our break. And then, um, just as a kind of curiosity, many of you are familiar with LHI. They are part of the Optum Group now. And um, as we depart from the building after the reception, I hope, um, rather than before, be careful out there. Um, Professor Sharoni slipped out there and broke her wrist, so we need you to be careful out there. So another round of applause for Dennis and for Brian. And we will adjourn to the Hall of Nations. Thank you so much for coming.